Welcome back into the KSO Sunday show. I am Mason Voth, joined as always by KSU underscore fan and Drew Galloway as we are here after a a mixed bag of emotions type of week for K-State basketball because they went on the road Tuesday, did their job against West Virginia in a very impressive way, taking care of the Mountaineers even after battling kind of some adversity in the first half and being down at halftime and ultimately winning the game by 14 points. It tied for the second largest win uh, that K-State has had in Morgantown. I think it was uh, that was with the 2019 team that maybe won by 14 when they went there. But Morgantown has not been an easy place for K-State to play. They flipped that around by immediately going to another place that has been really difficult for them in recent years. And as we know, K-State hasn't won in Lubbock since I think it was 2013 was the season. Well, they uh, were not able to get the win on Saturday, came up just short. So there's a lot to get to from K-State's one and one week. They are now 2-1 and one in Big 12 play, 12-4 and four overall. And as always, you're going to just be trying to jockey back and forth and figure out where the, the positioning for the NCAA tournament is. And also just in general, like it's for K-State and what they did last year and for so much of what, I mean, one of the major knocks on Bruce Weber was because there can be a hefty number. It was a guy that got teams to the NCAA tournament, but when they got there, they didn't do anything outside of one, in all honesty, fluky year. Like, you can't take the the accolade away from Bruce, and it, it happened, and the run was fun and real, but you got to play a 16 seed in the second round instead of a one seed for the first time in history. Like, it's a, it's a little fortunate. So you don't want to just get to the tournament if you're K-State. That is goal number one, but you also want to make sure that you have a team that can be competitive and give you the opportunity to at least win a game because that was the trait that Frank Martin had where he never showed up to an NCAA tournament and was one and done. And that always made the tournament at least a little bit more fun because you got the full weekend to experience it. Nobody wants to show up on Thursday afternoon, get bounced, and you're sitting around like, I don't really want to watch these basketball games. Like, I... I don't know that I watched a single Elite Eight game after K-State lost to Florida Atlantic last year. My interest just out the window. And so that is another thing that has to be dissected and diagnosed without K-State is playing. And I think we have, honestly, answers to both questions at this current point that I'm not sure that we anticipated we would have based on the non-conference and just kind of what we assumed with all the other things going on with this team. So, I, I, let's just fire it up, and right now, uh, I'll let each of you give general thoughts on the week that was. We don't have to dive into specifics on game by game quite yet, but just a couple of words or a sentence or something on what your thoughts of this week of K State basketball was, and I'll let Fan go first. The the first thing that comes to mind is is typically in a week, if you go one on one, one and one on the road in the Big Twelve, you're probably pretty happy with that and and maybe um at some point during the season we'll feel that way but the immediacy of of how you lost yesterday which we'll get into um factors into uh, a little bit more disappointing one-on-one week than than you would normally think um, that was a really good win at morgantown to beat west virginia that badly especially when they follow that up with a win over texas at home yesterday uh so so obviously they can they can play a little bit of basketball, um, and then you see you know K State right now you know we've only had three games but we're number two in defensive efficiency in just Big Twelve games so uh, defense is still a strong point. Yesterday's game defense was solid, and actually we're even number two in offense just because our offense was so good against UCF and, and pretty good against West Virginia even though it wasn't great yesterday. So you, you see some good things about this team um, through three games. Um, you do see the issues. Turnovers obviously are a problem for this team in, in all of our games so far. We're last in the league in turnover rate on offense. And then uh, rebounding has been a problem as well. So uh, we're, we're third to last in offensive rebounding rate allowed, even though we're pretty good on, on the offensive glass ourselves. So we kind of, kind of make up for it. Um, but it's things that we kind of thought this team was. Um, not a great shot-making team besides yesterday. Pretty good defensive team in the last 10 games and then a good offensive rebounding team. So uh, one-on-one is, is not bad, but you're, you're left with a bad taste in your mouth a little bit after yesterday's game. Yeah, I mean, 
it, it just feels like they left something out there. And I think that's kind of like how I would describe it. Uh, in the Big 12, like to be successful, you want to win most of your home games and steal a few on the road because winning on the road is so hard in this league that it feels like your margin for error at home shrinks a little when you lose a game like that and how they lost. And like it, it's the thing that I wrote. Uh, and the what we learned piece of like what we learned from this game is that it, you're you're gonna have the high highs during the game and you're still having the low lows and they still haven't found a way to consistently be either the good team or the bad team, which is kind of the frustrating thing about this team for me is that they have stretches like the ten minute stretch in the first half uh, last night where you're thinking wow, this team isn't just a tournament team, but like this is a a team that could be dangerous going forward, especially a big 12 play. And then they'll have, but then in the same game, you have the 10 minute stretch to start the game. And then you have the three minute stretch at the end of the game where you're like, how is this team where they are right now? Because they, they look like they haven't picked up a basketball before. And, and I think that that's kind of where you need to find somehow to find more consistency, but I just don't know if we're going to get that because we're like halfway through all of the games now in this regular season and we haven't gotten there. Yeah. I mean, I look, I think what you're talking about there is kind of in some way, what we know about this team or what I think a lot of people should know and appreciate and respect in some way is like, these aren't bad basketball players when they they played horrendously against or Oral Roberts, Nebraska, North Alabama, Chicago State, Wichita State to some extent. They just are basketball players that I I think struggle with the mental side of the game. I, I don't think this is a very smart basketball team, and I think that this coaching staff at times struggles to figure out how to get through to them. Now, in some ways, like, this is not me saying this about the players, but this is just a, a general comparison. It, like in life, you can try and teach somebody as many times as you want, but if somebody's stupid, they're just going to keep being stupid. I mean, I've got younger brothers. I can, I can show them how to unplug and then hook the PlayStation back up to the TV a hundred times, but they never were going to get it by themselves. I was always going to have to be the one to do it. I, you can, you can try, it's just not going to change anything. But the other thing that this team has that's a deficiency is outside of Tyler Perry, and he has struggled this year, none of these guys are great natural shooters. And so what you're saying, Drew, and what you saw in that stretch where K-State looked like they could be dangerous, this team can be very dangerous when they're making shots because they are so good at everything else, where they are a great defensive team right now against good competition in the Big 12. They are very good at, honestly, their athleticism is at a pretty high level, maybe outside of Tyler Perry, but he's lacking size. But, like, you think you're throwing Cam Carter at guys. He can do so much. Obviously, Arthur Kaluma has that opportunity. Um, there are a lot of things to like about this K-State team. And if the shooting that we saw yesterday at Texas Tech, I mean, you're not going to get it at over 40% consistently from really any team, especially this one. But that's why if K-State can just shoot it at – a an average or slightly below average clip, I think they can be a really good team and much better than what they've looked through the first, you know, 16 games of the season now and what we kind of had expectations at. Shooting is just the key thing to this team. And when when they are making shots, you're going to have a tough time beating them. And that's the thing we saw yesterday against Texas Tech is in the first half, Tech was dominating that game. K-State was killing themselves with dumb mistakes. And then the Cats started making shots. And Tech had nothing they could do, and the defense was suffocating. And when the other team is making shots, and they're also great defensively, you start to get really desperate. And that's why Tech didn't score for, what, the last, like, seven minutes of the first half yesterday? It's because K-State forced them into that spot. But then the second half, a lot of things to, to discuss and call a problem in that second half. Some to K-State's own doing, some because of officiating, like I talked about with you last night, Drew. But at the end of the day, K-State didn't make shots in the second half. I mean, Tyler Perry, he hit all those threes in rapid succession in the first half. You didn't get that from him in the second half. And as a team, K-State was 2 of 10 from 3 in the second. 
I, I read what fans said. I thought the same thing. I thought when Cam Carter hit that three to make it a five-point game, I thought that might be enough. And then, what, they they stretched it back up to nine. And obviously, from that point, K-State made some mistakes on their own. And when you make m- enough mistakes, you leave the game into the hands of the officials. They aren't perfect, and some of them will cost you, especially a guy making his first ever Big 12 officials appearance. That is a problem for K-State. They they got screwed yesterday, plain and simple. Number one by themselves, and then the death blow came from the refs. I mean, the, the, the missed travel on Joe Toussaint is a massive one because it gave them all three points that won that game for Texas Tech. Uh, and then it was a bad last possession by Tyler Perry, and that's where I think Jerome Tang is, is failing this team in some ways. But again, it also comes down to like, you can teach somebody only so many times before you have to just give up and say they're not going to get it. So let's just, you know, deal with the consequences. And maybe Arthur Kaluma got shoved there. He may have embellished it a little bit, but he he got shoved out of the way. So there's a there's a lot to go into from all of this. And um that I mean, that's a long way of talking about how good or bad K State can be. But I do think the one positive overall even as upsetting and disappointing as the game with Texas Tech ends yesterday is the fact that I think even when K-State isn't making shots and even when it feels like they're playing poorly, it is clear through these first three games that the version of poor basketball they play now is not anywhere close to as bad as the poor basketball they were playing in the non-conference. And I don't know what it is that has clicked with this team. Maybe it is that it's Big 12 play constantly, but – you are right now getting a team that the floor has been elevated, and that is probably the number one thing that gives K-State the chance to make the NCAA tournament and be a team that can maybe win a game. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't know if you guys want to get into this right now, but I've watched the last play probably a handful of times now, and I think my biggest issue with the, the final play and it's something that like I went back and forth a little bit on the board with some people is giving the ball to Tyler Perry and just t- kind of telling him to create because they brought up the last or the, his last shots and clutch shots in the past. And yes, it was some form of isolation, but there was at least a ball screen. There was no ball screen here. It was a, it was a screen to free. It was a double screen to free Tyler Perry up to get him the ball. And they just told him to create. And, and like what we've seen from Tyler Perry, that hasn't been his game at all this year. And the thing that kind of has thrown me, and I wonder if there was a, a breakdown or something, when you see Tyler Perry catch the ball, Arthur Kaluma comes from the inbounding uh, spot because he was a, the inbounder, and it kind of gets in the way but doesn't set a screen. And you wonder if he was supposed to set a screen there because Perry off of screens this year has been great. But I wonder if there was a miscommunication or breakdown there. But giving the ball to Perry and kind of just letting him go, that's one where like I'd like to see that be Cam Carter or Arthur mm-hmm. Kaluma because they you they've shown that they can provide an, an, an ability to get their own shot. Where Perry, when he's been told to just create with no ball screen, no nothing, it it typically ends the way that it did. And the other thing is like. Tyler Perry can make that shot. That doesn't make that a good shot or the shot that you want. Well, technically you can make any shot on the court, (laughs) but it doesn't mean that they're good shots. So yeah, no, uh, well, I'll I'll defer to fan here and and get his take on the the last play. Cause I I think it's, that's a problem that's played K-State all year late in the clock, whether it's the game or the shot clock, it just seems like they've had no direction and no plan. And it's been really ugly outside of Tyler Perry. Really, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong on how the the one against Villanova worked out, but the one against Oral Roberts that sent it to overtime, that was just he ran down the floor basically, and it was like, okay, this guy's trying to stay in front of you, protect a drive, and then he stepped back and hit the three, where kind of like what Drew's saying, Tyler Perry hitting those shots, it wasn't like it was just 30 seconds of holding the ball and then shooting at the last minute. It was there was other things going on that led to also helping open up the three point shot that Tyler Perry knocked down that was so big in those games. Yeah, I'd say both of those were more transition threes. One was a step back kind of against Villanova, I think. But um, yeah, I I agree with Drew. There had seemed like there had to be 
I was shocked that there wasn't a ball screen of some sort at the top for him. And, and I don't know if there was a mistake there. Um, I do agree also if, if you're going to have a drive for a jump shot or get to the rim, I would rather have Cam Carter be the guy in that situation. Um, I think he's better at getting those shots. He's not necessarily better at making those shots as his kind of stat, his shot chart show from the season, but he's our, he's a bigger and stronger guy. I mean, that, to me, that makes more sense, especially against a physical team like Texas Tech that's not going to get a call in that situation. And and I don't know if if Tang was trying to defer at the end in the press game when he press, – presser when he said, you know, he was probably naive to think – he would get a call because if that is absolutely true to, to be naive and thinking you're going to get a call in that situation. Like I know that Texas Tech had just gotten a call on the other end after travel, but we still did bump the shooter and he made the shot. And they did that twice, once on and off, three rebound on a free throw and once in the paint, two and once basically to win the game for Texas Tech down the stretch. Even with all of K-State's mistake, if, if those are just two-point makes and not and ones, K-State probably still wins the game, even with, with all the mistakes they made on the offensive end down the stretch. I mean, you really have to to make some major mistakes to blow an eight-point lead with three and a half minutes left in the game, and K-State did that. And the, only, the only other thing I will say, maybe in Tang's favor, is the only points we did score were Tyler Perry getting fouled and making two free throws trying to drive to the paint. So um, I don't know if he thought he could get that again, but it didn't work out. I mean – those situations that come down to one possession, I always go back to the, sh- the plays you missed before mm-hmm. that. Um, to me, and again, I'm not trying to blame Tyler Perry, but Tyler Perry going four for five in the first, what, 18 minutes of the game is what gave K-State a 10-point lead. But Tyler Perry going over six the rest of the game is what did not allow K-State to put that game away and not make it a one-possession pos- game with a minute left. And I think, to me, that's the story. Um Cam Corner, Cam Corner got a great offensive rebound three in the last minute or minute and a half, wide open at the top of the key that he missed. Also, mm-hmm. that would have put the game away, would have gave us a five point lead. So, those kind of misses are what really kill you down the stretch, and and a lead that should have been maybe thirteen at the five, three and a half minute mark instead of eight at the three and a half minute mark, and you win easily in the fi- final four minutes and not have to get yourself in a situation to lose a game. So, it'd be, I mean, it's always nice to think, well, you should make every play when you have the ball with the the clock shot off to win a game. But I, I think most of the time teams lose those games. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You win, you win those games because you put teams away. Well, that, that's the other thing, too, is I didn't like the strategy of waiting so long to get the shot off. I mean, there was essentially – 30, 30 plus seconds left, uh, just over 30 seconds. Like, especially in a game where you're only down one and you have a guy like Tyler Perry that can make a three from about anywhere. I know that it hasn't happened as consistently as some want, but that's his skill set. Go and try and get a shot in at least the first 15 seconds. And that, like, that to me in that situation, I feel like I'm giving you quite a bit of leniency to use a lot of clock there because you at least can try and maximize how many opportunities you're going to have at this. Whereas you only gave yourself one chance. And, you know, if this was last year's team, I may be more okay with that because Marquise Noel showcased that he can make those shots because, well, and you had tertiary options on last year's team that could make the shots like Ish Masood against Kentucky or, you know, Naquan Tomlin could do things for you. And then obviously you had Keontae Johnson, who's probably your number two. He made a big shot against Kentucky or he was, you know, catching lobs every third game to, to put the dagger in whoever they were facing. You don't have that on this team. So you need to play it a little bit more by the books, which I think would indicate to you, uh, you should have probably gone out there and tried to at least get two possessions at it to, to try and tie the game or take the lead. And so I'm a little disappointed that that wasn't the approach by K-State. And that's where this team is good enough and also bad enough right now to where they aren't done playing in close games in this league. And if you want to get into the NCAA tournament, you've got to win those games. And we know that K-State under Jerome Tang has been pretty good in them considering that he hasn't lost a game in overtime yet. Uh, And then they also have some other tight regulation wins. 
Like, I just think you have to give yourself numerous opportunities at it. They didn't. And then when you're when you are going to give it just one shot, you got to do something better than Tyler Perry just dribbling around and then hoping that he gets fouled. Now, I will I will give Jerome Tang a little bit of leeway on what he said after the game because like thinking back on it, that is probably his not so subtle way but trying to avoid being penalized for criticizing the officiating yesterday, which K-State lost that game on their own. But Tech didn't deserve to win that game more than K-State did. Tech just benefited from the fact that somehow they got to be the, m- the more physical team and were only called for 10 fouls. K-State was called for 19 of them in the game. That math doesn't totally compute in my head. Um, but that's just that's a side note. And again, like I, I've said repeatedly here, because I know people think that I'm Mr. Hate on the officials guy. Look, part of that stems from I do hate officials. Uh, I do think they they suck for the most part. but. I umpired, I've umpired baseball since I was 13 years old. Like, I, I get it. I've done it. It's part of the job to be criticized. And I feel like from my experiences in doing that, I have somewhat of an understanding on how to police a game and how to make calls and how to work with a crew in some of these things. And when I see it being misapplicated, I'm going to to call it out, but I, I am trying to be softer to them by not putting this loss on the refs because it's not on the refs why K State lost this game, but it played a major part in the outcome in the final minute of it because of the Toussaint travel that wasn't called, and obviously you can look at some other things too that happened throughout the course of the game. So I, I will give Jerome Tang some slack. I think that's his way of kind of sticking up for his guys and also saying like the officiating sucked. Uh, and I, I'd be interested in in what the Big 12 kind of does moving forward because you just had a guy make his Big 12 debut and it didn't go very well. Because in addition to it being his first game and you know the the, the officiating you know kind of being in in question with how everything worked out, he was the ref that was in the middle of a lot of these calls that were significant in the game where when guys were having to be broken up or something was having to be explained or looked at, he is right there in the center. He's the ref you saw on TV, like in the, in the mix. So that's a, that's a major thing. And I, I think that's one where the big 12 has got to be smarter. Like if you know, a guy hasn't done a big 12 game before, send the dude to Stillwater. Don't send him to Lubbock. Like, what are you doing? Uh, That place will eat you alive. I mean, it's one of the, you know, five toughest places in the league. So that is uh, that's the the final take on officiating there and everything else that went down. Uh, it, w- what what positives can be taken away from yesterday and where where is your outlook for K State right now? I'll let Fan go first because I think he he's probably the most optimistic out of the three of us generally. So I'll let him start off with uh, his thoughts. Um, number one, the shooting you talked about. Um, it is good to see you. A forty-plus point three-point percentage game from the Cats. Um, you know, Perry made shots, but Cam Carter was uh, three of five, I think, from three, which is which is one of his better games. Um, Kalum was two for five from three. Gasson finally hit a three this season, so yeah. you you shot the ball fairly well from three. Um, that's a good sign for this team. Um, I think it's something that will give them more room for error. What we talked about. Um, they won the rebounding battle, although not by a big advantage in the second half was bad. Um, you won the offensive rebounding rate battle, 39% to 38%. You don't want to give up that much, but you still win the rate battle, which it, to me is a, a good sign for a team. But, you know, it, it goes back to um, Texas Tech scores one point for every offensive rebound they get. K State points scores 0.45 points for every offensive rebound you get. Now I, I know that's not. Sometimes you get two or three offensive rebounds on a trip, so it's not like a one to one ratio on that stat. But I think it evens out over time, and that's been a trait for K State not only this year but last year. Not scoring uh, on every on offensive rebounding opportunities the same rate as their opponents, and that's really that's really tough because you do work hard to get those. But to not be able to follow those up and make those shots is disappointing. Um, so th- those would be the two biggest ones to take take away for me. Um, there wasn't a lot <laughs> of good other than that. I mean, you had a 54% effective field goal percentage rate, which is really good, mainly boosted by your three-point shooting compared to only 41% for Tech. 
you know, usually you do that, you win most games. So there were some things that were good. Um, you know, I don't, you know, if we, if we want to go to the bad, just a few that really stuck out, you turn it over 30% of the time. Yep. That's tough. Yeah. To, uh, the biggest one to me, there's two, two real factors. K-State shot seven free throws and Tech shot 18. K-State had been making more free throws than their opponents attempted all year. Texas Tech scores 10 more points from the free throw line, which that's a big deal for me. Then the other one is I, I like to track shots at the rim. K-State averages 23 shots at the rim this year. They shot 11 against Tech. And they they averaged 10 to 11 two-point jump shots or runners or, or just shots not at the rim. And they shot 16 against Tech. So you had to shoot a lot more long twos. Um, you didn't get the shots at the rim you usually get. And, and that that's a big factor. Now, I will say Tech is the best defense in the league at preventing shots at the rim combined with two-point percentage at the rim. They're the best. If you combine those two stats together, they're the best team in the league. So part of that is Tech's defense is going to do that. You're going to be able to do that better at home. Uh, but the free throws and the shots at the rim, K-State's got to get 15 to 20 shots at the rim, and they've got to get 15 to 20 free throws if they want to win games in this league, and they didn't come close to that in that game. Yeah, I mean, I, this fan took all of the stats, so I'll just, I'll be, <laughs> my, my positive will be that, and this is kind of a combined of both games, is case it went to two pretty tough environments, granted West Virginia, not a terribly tough environment right now, but they did just beat Texas at home, and they took care of business and won and should have won the other one. So that makes you think that going forward on the road, that K-State will probably be okay and be in a lot of these games. And then you just hope that they make the plays at the end. Because, I, I mean, it it's one where, like, you can probably chalk up uh, going to Allen Fieldhouse as probably a loss. But what? the other <laughs> <laughs> But but the other ones you kind of look at and you're like, I don't see why K State couldn't win it, mm -hmm. and, and like, I don't know if we would say that probably two weeks ago right now that you could see a possibility that they could maybe win at Ames, maybe win at Houston, it they should win in Stillwater, maybe they win in Provo, maybe they win in Austin, maybe they win in Cincinnati. Like, there are going to be games down the stretch where you think that they have a chance right now on the road with how they're playing. And, and it makes you feel a lot better about this team because like I said, like winning on the road is so hard that then in turn, like you feel pretty good about where this team is and all their home games that are remaining. So you're, you're seeing the ceiling increase, but the hard part about this team is the floor is so low. Like the, the first 10 minutes, of the game and then the final three minutes yesterday, like that was probably some of the worst stretches of basketball of the entire season. Well, I, I think the concerning thing would be that if you're looking at it from this standpoint, uh, at, right now I can confidently say that I, K State can beat anybody in the Big 12 right now the way that they're playing. Um, and, and that, I mean, that's because we don't know who the best team in the league is right now based on how some teams have gone out and looked. But it wouldn't just be like a UCF one-off. You can beat the best team. I, K State could, by the end of the year, have multiple wins against the teams that finish in the top three of the league. I, I, that would not surprise me. The problem, though, stems from what you're kind of saying there, Drew. Is we can also look at this team and and say that they can play bad enough still to where they play at the level of Oklahoma State or West Virginia, and that is going to be something that is a problem. And you played like that for the first 12 minutes against Texas Tech yesterday. You're probably lucky you did it against Texas Tech, who is, I mean, they're they're better than anticipated. They're fine, but they are not as good as some of the others that you face. And Tech doesn't have some of the traits that will beat you, which to that point, like, let me give you the bad before I give you the good. And the pick and preview, the reason why I picked K-State was because, yes, I think K-State is playing better. But if you look at Tech, they were due for some regression and some of the things that were benefiting them. And we saw that yesterday where they were shooting threes at a level that was beyond what they should. Joe Toussaint was a big part of that. 
Um, you, you look at Pop Isaac's career versus what he had done the first two games of Big 12 play, and what happens yesterday, they're 5 of 25 from 3, 20%, and you don't take advantage of that because you turn the ball over 18 times, and another aspect where I thought K-State should have an advantage yesterday was their size, and it was negated by the fact that Will McNair was terrible for 35 minutes of the game yesterday, and David Gasson, who had grabbed, what, 21 rebounds the first two games of Big 12 play, only comes down with four yesterday, and you didn't get anything out of those guys. And then, obviously, the the spot that K-State regressed in the most is kind of what Fan talked about is the free throw situation, which somewhat out of your control, but also yesterday, I mean, K-State, you shoot 23 threes and you make 10 of them, like you're not going to have as many opportunities mm -hmm. inside. So I'll at least give uh, credence to that a little bit. But if we want to look at a positive for this, and I tweeted this out last night, but seven teams through the first three games of Big 12 play have played two of their three games on the road. Here are the records of those teams. K-State, two and one. Cincinnati one and two, Houston one and two, Oklahoma one and two, Texas one and two, BYU one and two, and Oklahoma State 0 oh and three. And of those teams, Houston, Oklahoma, Texas, and BYU are all in the top 25 as of now. Now we know that'll probably change for Texas and probably BYU. We'll see um, if their win against UCF was enough to keep them in there. But that is something that, I, like, sometimes these stats through three games they don't really mean much, but it does mean something that K-State protected their home floor in the one opportunity they had, something that BYU did not do, and they went on the road and they were able to get at least one of those games, something other teams were not able to do is get that combo of protecting home floor and getting one on the road. If K-State can make that trade off this year where they win seven games at home and then – we're looking at it. I mean, you only need basically one more road win, we would think. Like, that's doable. And the way K-State's <laughs> playing right now, they are going to be able to use the benefit of the home crowd in Bramlage to be a really tough place to play and be a tough team to beat in Manhattan. I, I don't anticipate K-State getting blown out in any game played in Bramlage. They're going to have an opportunity to win every single one of those games. When you go on the road, you're going to have some real stinkers. TCU last year, Oklahoma last year. Texas Tech, to some extent, although they did have an opportunity in that game at least. Um, Lawrence, like we know that's already a write-off. But all we're asking is you put a performance or two together where you can steal a win on the road. Like, you should be able to win in Stillwater, and then it's going to be about finding it elsewhere. We know BYU is beatable at home. Cincinnati did it, um, and I don't think BYU is as good as – you know, the non-con and the, the top 25 ranking would indicate. I, they've gained my respect a little bit more than what I thought I'd give them to this point. But there's nobody that's unbeatable for K-State. It's just limit the amount of times and the amount of minutes that you look like you play for Mike Boynton instead of Jerome Tang. So that would be uh, my thing to, to throw out there with, with that. So uh, any other thoughts on this week or anything we just kind of went over before we move on here? Another positive I thought of was, was Cam Carter had his two most efficient games of the season the last two games back-to-back -back on the road. Um, hit threes this game against West Virginia was more getting to the free throw line a bunch. Um, hit twos at a strong rate, got some rebounds, got some assists. So Cam Carter playing well is, is a key for this team. Um, and then the, the negative I will say, I just went, I was just looking through the stat broadcast. Arthur Columa shot one shot in the final 15 minutes of the game yesterday. Yeah. One, one mm -hmm. attempt, and that was with six and a half minutes left. So that would be my and, – and, and to Tang's credit, he's talked about that before, is that sometimes it seems like they have trouble finding shots for Arthur Columa. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that's the defense. Like I think teams are showing, like, if you take away his right hand, he's going to have a lot a tough time because he, he has a tough time going left. Um, but – you got to, that's where you got to. I, mean, I know they want to run five out, but they're running more sets anyway. You can run some sets to get Kaluma some shots. And I think that's going to be something they need to try to do moving forward. Cause they were obviously running. <laughs> we talked about it earlier, but they thought, I think we could pick and roll Texas Tech to death because they switch everything. And I think we thought, well, we'll get Will McNair and David Gasson on a guard in the paint and we would flub the pass or missed a shot at the rim or turn it over. That was especially the first 10 minutes of the game. Um, so when those strategies you have don't work 
and then you have to go another direction. I think that is part of it as well. And that was final thing is that was a classic McCaslin. I know he's played faster, but yesterday was mm-hmm. what Grant McCaslin wants to do. It was a 59 yeah. possession game. It was a slug fest and they were just trying to beat us up and in, in large part they did. That's why they won. Yeah, they succeeded at that. Uh, so good for them. Uh, just a, a quick check in on uh, what's going on. Uh, Memphis had over ha- had a hundred points with over five minutes to play in their game at Wichita State right now. They were at one point seventeen of twenty four from three in the game. So always fun for me to see. And they just banged home another one. So shout out to the <laughs> Memphis Tigers. Things that you just love to see. Uh, Wichita State getting blasted at their home court. I also want to make note, Wichita State today, they were doing a stripe out. They wanted to stripe out the Tigers, you know, an animal that has stripes. And they put the the shirts on the chairs for everybody when they got there. That is a great idea. I think more teams should do that. And if you're going to do a stripe out, give away shirts, have them there for everybody. You might want to make sure that you're going to get a well-attended game because <laughs> – it's pretty easy to see when shirts are just sitting there unclaimed in empty seats. It, <laughs> it makes the place pop a little bit more when there are empty seats, uh, which you can very much see from the TV camera. So that is my uh, weekly shot at Wichita State, and we can move on here with everything else going on. So uh, let's break it up. Let's take a look at what went down in the rest of the Big 12 this weekend. KU takes care of Oklahoma at home, 78-66. to 66. Oklahoma now has a pair of losses. Know about K State and Tech, uh, UCF. They tried following up the win against KU by getting a second win and being in the group of two and one teams. Instead, they fell to BYU, but it came down to the wire. TCU skates by Houston, and if not for bogus officiating in Allen Fieldhouse, they would be three and zero and have wins over three top ten teams to start Big Twelve play. TCU probably deserves more credit than even I've given them, and I've tried to give them quite a bit. Uh, fans' own countyman, Josh Eiler, goes and gets his first Big 12 win against Texas in Morgantown yesterday, 76-73. to 73. And Texas is a lucky bounce on a Max Aceman, sh- Max Aceman shot in the midweek away from being 0-3 in Big 12 play. So they've Max got Aceman issues. Also traveled. Yeah, yeah, and I think we know what their problem is. It's the fact that, oh, who would have thought the guy that coached at UTEP and wasn't very good, Rodney Terry, probably isn't cut out to be a coach in the Big 12 Conference. Uh, Speaking of other other guys not cut out to be a coach in the Big 12 Conference, Mike Boynton, nice guy, terrible (laughs) basketball coach. They got their butts kicked yesterday by Iowa State, 66-42. to After the game, Mike Boynton, these are his actual words. He said that they played like, quote, shit. And uh, when Alex sent that quote to me, I said, yeah, I mean, that's true, but somebody might want to also just tell him that they're a bad team. So I think they just played like a bad team. And then Baylor, they are 3-0, and and they are the luckiest 3-0 and because they have not played like they did in the non-con, and they survived a scare from Cincinnati uh, in Foster Pavilion last night. So it's Baylor and Tech all by themselves at the top of the Big 12, and then a handful of teams at two and one, and then everybody at one and two except for the aforementioned shit. Mike Boynton's words, not mine, uh, at the bottom of the league at 0 and 3. So uh, I'll look at you guys here, and uh, you can go ahead and uh, give some of your takes on what went down this weekend in the Big 12. Yeah, I think you, you bring up Baylor. They're our next opponent, so it's apropos, but. Uh... They are kind of skinning by, you know, overtime overtime win, a, a, a win against BYU that was much closer in the last four minutes, and then yesterday's game. So, um, my, my biggest thing is with Baylor is they're playing like Baylor pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. That they have a really good offense and they can shoot the ball, but their defense is average at best. Um, they've defended okay in the Big Twelve, but I think that's more because of who they've played than the defense they've played. So. Um, you, you got them, um, you know, KU one and one on the week, getting a home win against Oklahoma. Oklahoma was competitive in that game. I'm, I'm interested to see how this league catches up with the new teams. I think it's, I think we already see it with Houston. I think we're going to see it with BYU. I think we're going to see it with Cincinnati, UCF, 
we'll see. Um, Cause I, they're going to have excited home crowds as these new teams come in, especially teams like KU or Baylor or top of the league type teams, but playing on the road for these teams is going to become brutal. Yep. I think. Yeah. And I, and I think it's just, I think we see it, especially with Houston. I mean, this is a really good basketball team, but they're one and two in the league and, and, uh, um, learning what it's like to play in this league. They're still number one in the net, uh, even though they lost twice already in this league because they've lost close. But it's going to catch up with those teams. So um, that's something to watch. I, I, I appreciate you mentioned t- TCU. TCU looks much better than I imagined. I mean, Emmanuel Miller was has been a fine player for them, but he's one of the best players in the league right now. So give them credit for, for him. And Jamie Dixon kind of continuing to play. They continue to play a frantic pace. They're number one at getting to the rim and making shots at the rim. Um, so they're still playing that style, even though you lose some really good guards. Um, you're still making that work. So so give them credit. Iowa State's brutalizing teams like they want to do and win games without scoring 60 points as much as possible. Um, so th- it's not probably a place you want to go, but uh, uh, you should be able to win at home against that team. Um, so I'm anxious to see what Cincinnati does. I think you're right on with Texas. Talented team, but I they could be maybe the team that becomes the biggest disappointment in this league, I think, as the, as the season goes on. They're very lucky to be one and two, uh, and, and I think they're going to find it tough sledding. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point there. I, I will say in this, Baylor, that was one of the things that, that I noticed on them. If you go and look at – Everything. I mean, maybe Jerome Tang. He he was their he was their their defensive <laughs> wizard down there. Uh, the 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 key to it because, yeah. I mean, last year they had a, a big drop in defense compared to what yeah. they had been previously. Uh, they they went from the year prior they were 13th in defensive efficiency. They dropped all the way to 107th, and then we know how good they were in 21 and 20. Um, 20 they were fourth in the country, uh, yeah. and then 21 they were 22nd when they won the national title. And then you know, thirteenth a year later, so they have they have fallen off already in in how this has worked out, uh, and they're probably heading in that direction right now. And they've been fortunate, and that's why I mean, we'll talk about it in a moment, uh, the, the week that's coming up for K State. But number one, you think about what they've done. Two of those games were at home. BYU and Cincinnati are home games that they were tied in, and the other one was at the worst team in the league in an environment that. I mean, I, I don't know when the last time you've been to a basketball game in Stillwater is fan, but like Drew, you you know this. Stillwater, I, I've never been there when it's been a good crowd. Like last year, I think was the most full I ever saw it, and half of it was lavender. I, and, I was gonna say last year was pretty close to 50-50. Yeah. <laughs> so like you have not faced anything like what you're going to get when you go to Bramlage on Tuesday night. Students are gonna be back, the team is playing good, the energy is back up. Like, you're going to be in for it. That's going to be a legit crowd. And the other thing that will add into this when we're talking about new teams going on the road, um, I mean, just, like, look at what the American Athletic Conference looks like now and these venues that they're in. Like, I just made fun of Wichita State earlier, but it, it stands to kind of what we're talking about here. Houston last year, your best crowd, you're going on the road and, you know, not playing in a full building, even in Wichita where... As much as I give them crap, like they love their basketball. They're not showing up for it, though. It's not the most, you know, crazy crowd out there. You're also making trips like we talked about to Greenville and Philadelphia (laughs) and New Orleans and wherever. You're not facing any of this. And now you're going on the road to better competition and in most spots, better crowds. Now, the weird thing about TCU is, is like, that is one of the the lesser crowds you're going to see this year. I think they hold just over 6,000 in there. And, like, it's going to get even worse. I mean, they got it in Hilton in the midweek, but it's going to get worse for later in the year when I don't know their schedule, but I do think they have to go to Allen um, and obviously some other options. And that's where I think it stings for K-State that you're not going to get some of these vulnerable good teams like Houston and like Texas at home. Those are road-only games this year. So – uh, that that's what I'll say there. So I'll let Drew give his thoughts on the rest of the Big Twelve. Uh, I think so you guys kind of hit on the teams that have kind of stood out either a good or a bad way, not just this week, but kind of in general. 
I think my kind of takeaway right now in the Big 12 is I, I'm not sure how many wins will win the Big 12 right now because you've kind of already seen chaos. And so, like, it, this could be a year where 13 and 5 probably gets you a share. Like, a t like KU, you would think that they would be three and zero right now, but they've already lost in Orlando. Mm-hmm. Texas Tech is three and zero, but I don't think anybody expects that to continue. Baylor three and zero, but haven't looked great. Houston was another one that was a potential favorite to win the league, one and two to start. So five losses will probably get you a share of the league title, or you'll probably be second. So if you're a contender right now you're thinking how do we get to 14 and four and 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 this is just how the league rolls of you you look at a lot of team schedules and you think wow they could either win this game or like it could definitely go the opposite way and they could lose like there's no real gimme game in this league unless you're probably getting oklahoma state at home yeah yeah, yeah that's... Cur- currently uh, Ken Palm projects Houston thirteen and five and Baylor twelve and six as the best two teams in the league. Thirteen and five, KU in the last five years has has five or six years has won it a handful yeah. of times at thirteen and five. Um, I'm looking through the the annals of history to see uh, how many times it's it's been l- six losses or more. Um, but then we get into the era where there were only 16 conference games. Yeah. So yeah. you're, I don't think, I don't think there's ever been a big 12 champ with six or more losses. No. No. I don't ultimately, it seems unrealistic that we might get there just because I, the longer the season plays out, somebody will probably rise up. But if there was ever a year for it to happen, it seems very apparent right now that this would be the year um, that it, that it would come down to that. And, uh, OU and KU in 2005 shared the league title. They both went 12 and four. Um, so that, I mean, that like, that's where 12 wins kind of peaked for you. And, but again, you didn't have two other games on there that the league has now. So it's, it's going to be fun to follow along with. And it makes it good for a team like K state right now, where we don't know necessarily what they are and how things might end up working out. But, there is an opportunity with as much parity and as you know strugglesome as the entirety of the league has been where you you're not going to be out of this thing and you're going to have a chance in every single game. So I'll flash the big 12 standings up there one more time because it is kind of fascinating to look at right now. And again, I think also gives good perspective on where K state is at right now, where yes, in the non-conference, I would say Nebraska is probably the only game you want back. You could maybe uh, call up the scheduling gods and say, hey, maybe we could play USC anytime except for the first game of the season and maybe not Miami when they shoot the lights out because they're unstoppable when that happens because they've had some uh, down stretches. But I, outside of that, like, there's only six teams in the Big 12 right now that have a winning record through three games, and you're one of them. That says a lot because you can look at the teams that do not have it And you can also say that, yes, you haven't played the top teams in the league in terms of what we assume, but you haven't played teams that are like total slouches. And there are other teams on here that they should have every opportunity to be two and one or three and oh, and they haven't come through. So K State has done enough so far. And if you, you know, keep going two and one every three games, nobody's going to have a problem with that. It's just a matter of, you know, can they keep that up and, and can they do it? So. All right, let's roll on. Let's start focusing on what K-State has this week. Two home games in the return to Bramlage, Tuesday night, Saturday night. Uh, going to be a, a very entertaining and fun time. Uh, Baylor is first up. Look, I part of my logic for picking K-State against Texas Tech was I thought Tech was kind of due. And in reality, they were. Just K-State found a way to really give it up. Uh, Baylor is in that same boat, and I don't know if I'm going to be tabbed with pick and preview, but I think K-State beats Baylor on Tuesday night. On the, on the flip side, not to be the cynical person, okay. but you could, you could say that Baylor's due to play really well. That is also true. That is also true, and I've thought about that. Uh, Tuesday night might be a night where they go like 13 of 25 from three because uh, it could happen because that's been one of the spots that they've struggled in when I've watched them this year is – 
they haven't hit shots like they were at the beginning of the season when they were like 46% or something. I, I also hate saying this in a game where Baylor might be fringe top 10 and will be favored, but you do feel like it would be very nice to go 2-0 because you're defending, you're playing on your home court. Yep. So yep. It, 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 it's weird because of that, but like at the same time with where you want everything to go, the Oklahoma state win doesn't really do you anything. It's just another, it's just another win. It's like you would want the, you would want to go to and oh, because the Baylor win would be massive as, as K state still searches for a quad one win. Yep. Very true. Yep. When I look at Baylor, um, we talked about K-State at the rim. While Baylor is pretty good at preventing shots at the rim, opponents shoot only about 29% of their shots at the rim, which is top 10 in the country. Opponents make almost 70% at the rim against Baylor, which is number 360 in the country. So they do not have a very good defense at the rim if you can get there. Um, K-State's been pretty good at getting to the rim. Um, even as bad as, as Will McNair played, and, and Gasson really didn't have any sh many shots against Texas Tech. This opportunity for those two to, to maybe get some work done. Um, Baylor's really a guard-laden team that likes to shoot threes. Um, I, I do think the other thing when looking at Baylor is you never know when that freshman wall is going to hit. I think you've seen that a little bit with Jacoby Walter the last few games because he's only, what, four of 21 – or four of 17 from – 16 from three, the last three games for them. So um, hopefully you can you can take care of that. Um, you know, speaking of, we like to – I don't – and I don't know how serious K-State was in the mix, but when I look at all the guards K-State missed out on, Ray J. Dennis is maybe the one I wish we had the most because he's such a good point guard and distributor and – pretty tough as well. So I think he's really almost probably the key for them right now. Um, as much as, as talented as Jacoby Walk, Walker is, he's re, Walter is, he's really, really good. But Ray J. Dennis and, and Jalen Bridges, um, Links and Love, those those that four is, is their best core players. So if K State can defend that four and they're they're none of them are big, they're all six five or smaller. Uh, or Bridges is big, six nine, you get you give yourself a chance. So um, I, I agree. I I, I kind of thought going into this week, counting yesterday and, and Tuesday, I thought K State should be able to go one and one. Um, I was hoping for you know two and zero would have been nice, but you're hoping for one and one in those two games. This is really and, and you talked about it earlier, Drew, losing the road game like you did reduces your margin for error. You don't have a, a must win game on January 17th or whatever this game is. But in light of what we just did, it almost becomes a must-win game because you can't string together bad losses. That's that's when you get yourself in trouble. You string, And this wouldn't be a bad loss, but you can't string together losses, you get, wins you got to get. And K-State, like you said, right now we don't have a quad one win. You got to get some sometime. This would be a great opportunity to do so. Hopefully we have a juice crowd. Um, and uh, And – Losing at home to Oklahoma State would just be a disaster with the way that team <laughs> would. Like, I don't even want to talk about that as a as a realm of possibility. You just we, can't. You we can't would be right back to where we were after yeah. North Alabama and games like yeah, that. Yeah, you you cannot lose that game. Really, it's you know, and I'm not overlooking. I'm not looking ahead, looking whatever. You got to win Tuesday night against Baylor. That's that's where the focus is, has to be going into this week. Yeah, but uh, also just make sure you do everything to not lose to Oklahoma State because yes. that uh, that would that would kill the vibes dead in its tracks if that happened. <laughs> so you yeah. cannot you cannot let that go down. Uh, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, they, I'll, I'll throw this out. It, it, would would you guys consider a success being one and one, but the win is Baylor? Uh, uh that would probably make me feel really gross about this team. I don't know. <laughs> I, look, I, I hate to be this guy, and I know it's probably <laughs> wrong, but I, I do think, to me, I put more stock in teams going out and beating the teams that they should beat oh, yeah. as opposed yep. to going out and maybe having your Bruce Weber magic level game and then not beating who you should. Um, yep. that, that's, that gives me more concern. I mean, that's 
Maybe it's the Cowboys fan in me talking because they like to kick the crap out of bad teams and then very rarely beat the good ones. But, um, I mean, as we've seen with them this year, they kicked the crap out of the bad teams. And, yes, they lost They lost four games to really good teams. They also beat some good teams down the stretch, you know, that, that are in the same category as them. Like, those teams will eventually get to the point where they need to be like K-State last year. We saw, like, they – they they reached their peak in the NCAA tournament, and that was perfect for them. So, uh, I would I would reject losing losing to Oklahoma State to get a win against Baylor, uh, because also like I think bad losses can hurt you more than anything. And K State has plenty more opportunities for good wins. Really, really bad losses like Oklahoma State at home, you don't have many opportunities for those. So yeah. just avoid them all together. I'm glad that we're all on the same page, but I just want to throw that out there. You know, you never know. <laughs> I didn't know where you were going with it. I thought maybe you were trying to make the case for it. So, oh, you know, no. it's it's an interesting discussion because you know, K State had Bill Snyder, who his mo was winning the games you should win. Like that was Bill Snyder's thing. Like you don't lose games you shouldn't lose. But then we had you know Frank Martin would lose games you shouldn't, but then go get crazy wins and. and and not yes. quite to the same extent. Kleiman has done that as well, beating Oklahoma yeah. twice and then losing some games you shouldn't lose, like Iowa State this year and mm-hmm. Arkansas State and West Virginia his first year. So, yep, you, I would rather I'm with you, Mason. It's much less frustrating as a fan to win all the games you should win, and yeah. then once in a while win a game you shouldn't, than to lose games you sh- losing games you shouldn't lose is super frustrating as a fan, and, and you don't want to be there and. And Oklahoma State would be losing a game you shouldn't lose on steroids, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, very good point. Uh, I think, yeah, that's a that's a that's a good note there. Look, I, I think that K State is is going to come out, and I maybe we're getting a, a better version and a more real version of them right now. Uh, with, like, I obviously the, as well as they shot against Tech, that's not what they are. But this team. Even as not great as of shooters as I think they have, I don't think they should be at thirty percent. They get yeah. good enough looks, and uh, there's Cam Carter. It doesn't look unnatural. Arthur Kaluma it doesn't look unnatural. Tyler Perry, he does make it look unnatural for himself sometimes, even though he is a natural shooter, uh, and he's done better about correcting that. And like people are gonna get upset because he missed all of them in the second half, and it looks like a lot because he was four of eleven yesterday. If you shoot a four of eleven average on the season, we'll take that right now. Like that's fine. That's yeah. what thirty seven some percent. Yeah. So uh, you, you'll take that. And I think this team is getting closer to being the real version of themselves. And the real version of K State, at least what I'm starting to think it is. I know that they can beat Baylor based on how they've played to start the season. And I, you're right, Drew. Like Baylor could bust out and have an awesome shooting night because they are due for that. But this is also a team that, as Eminem once said, by the skin of the teeth and their hair <laughs> on their blank, they are skating by right now. And so I think it's time for K-State to uh, deliver that first loss. to So I, I, do, I do think K-State wins both games this week. It, it's also game 17 in their second true road game of the season because yep. they played Michigan State and Detroit. So mm-hmm. the only other road game was at Stillwater. So that's that's kind of cra- crazy. I mean, I mean, I know most teams don't play – you might play one road game in your non-conference, but it's still kind of crazy to be mid-January and playing your second true road game of the year. Oklahoma State, they are bad. Mike Boynton has admitted to them <laughs> playing bad. Uh, what, what should people know about the Cowboys, though, going into this? Because I will say this, most people, myself included, until I looked at them uh, probably like four weeks ago, I think the first time we did Big 12 rankings, I was like, up. Oh, Oklahoma State, bad as always, can't shoot, brick town, all this stuff. And then I go and look, I'm like, they're shooting 38% yeah. from three. They are the total opposite of what they've been. They are actually shooting it well this year. They still suck. So uh, still what suck. What do you guys think of Oklahoma State and the ensuing game this weekend uh, that K-State will get with them? Yeah, I would agree. Um, it's a little bit surprising to see them shooting. You know, Right now they're 36%. Um, for the season. They're only 29% in their three Big 12 games, though, so maybe they're coming back down to earth, kind of like Texas Tech we talked about. Um, They really, you know, you look at, they did play Baylor close at home, but they got drilled in both of their road games against Texas Tech and Iowa State, so you would hope K-State can bring that. Their other road game they lost at Southern Illinois, 
this season. So um, not a good team. Um, their best win would be what? Tulsa. So um, when Tulsa is your best win, you may not be that great a team. Now, the, the feather they do have is they beat Chicago State by 19. So um, they drilled Chicago State the night after we had a six-point tussle with the the uh, Cougars. So maybe that's going to be what Boynton uses to motivate his team. Um, because they're besides shooting, offensively, they're not good anywhere else. Um, defensively, they're decent um, in multiple areas, top 75 in the country in Ken Palm defensively. But just not a real good team, and it seems like Mike Boynton has to be on the hot seat at this point, and it's only going to get worse probably as the season goes. Uh, by the way, what a bizarrely scheduled game, Oklahoma State going on the road to Southern Illinois. That, yeah, yeah that, that made no sense. That was like, are you just wanting to lose a, a dumb game? Yeah, that, that, that is it, like Mike Boynton scheduling that. Like That's like asking for a loss. Uh, Oklahoma State isn't very good. The thing that, like just looking at them right now, the thing that really stands out to me is they are like by far one of the worst teams in the country from the free throw line. They only shoot 65%. <laughs> yeah. Which, which, which in turn, like I think that, that makes their three point shooting percentage kind yes. of a barrage. Yeah. You, you are what you are from the free throw line. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Boynton's days are numbered. I wrote that earlier today. So. Yeah. They like Bryce Thompson is somehow still there. <laughs> yeah, Jayhawk legend. Like every, every, everybody else for their team, like John Michael Wright, somehow still there. Like they 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 don't recruit well, and they don't like get rid of their bad players either. So they, they kind of are what you would expect. Just, just happy to have you here. Is is the the, the Mike Boynton. Uh, philosophy i think yeah it's not not great for k-state uh or not great for oklahoma state and that's what makes it a good opportunity for k-state is that look i whatever happens against baylor you absolutely should be at the worst three and two after the first five games of big 12 play and given the circumstances i think a lot of people would take that and that does set you up in an opportunity moving forward to you know go where you want to go. I mean, what is the, what should the expectation be for K state and, and how we see more growth? Because I think that's the one thing that we can all agree on through the first three games of big 12 play. This team has grown and gotten better. So what does K state have to do this week to prove that they have found another area to get better in, at least in your eyes, Drew, I'll let you go first. Cause I think fan might be, turn the computer on his brain on and, and, and compiling some numbers for us. I was going to say, he can compile some numbers and I'll just kind of say like the aesthetics. Uh, some analytics? Yeah. The, like the, the way that I would say that they could get better, I think, is to put a full 40 minutes together because we're still kind of waiting on that to happen. At least like, play like a – uh, an almost full 40 minutes. Give me like 37 and a half or 36 or something. Make the really stinky stretches less, less stinky. long. Yeah, like you could say UCF was the closest they've gotten to a full 40, uh, but they kind of coasted at the end, and I, I think that everybody kind of saw that. Um, but I, I would say just putting a full 40 minutes together and having the – and I guess or is more of a – this is an or statement, or – have the stinky stretch be a lot less stinky. Like, yes. Because the, the, when they've been bad, it, it's been pretty bad. Yes, it has been. All right, uh, Fan, what, what do you got for us? Because I'm sure you, you can enlighten the people on what case they need to get better on. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think we, we, we know this one. Quit turning the ball over 14 or 15 times a game or more. 30%, 22% turnover rate in Big 12 play. And then for the season, they're outside the top 300 in turnover rate. Um, you know, Tang likes to bring up the stat of whatever the record is, if they have 12 or 11 turnovers in a game, which is it's pretty good. So um, that's one um, I talked about earlier. Take advantage. I mean, if you're going to be top 10 in the country in offensive rebounding, take advantage of it and score some points off of those because uh, that's a frustration that, that we don't 
score as many points off offensive rebounds as we as we I think we can. You know, you need to you need to up that ratio of how many points you score off offensive rebounds. And you know, I think what you said earlier is is prove it that you can shoot the ball. Um, Big 12 play, K State is second in three point percentage at 38 percent through three games. So that's a good sign, as as what we talked about going into the Big 12 play. Um, but you got to keep that going. Um, Cam Carter hitting some shots, being efficient is nice to see. Um, and then you know, getting Kaluma more shots where he can make shots on the floor, like like I mentioned earlier, one shot in the last 15 minutes of a tight game for Arthur Kaluma is inexcusable when he's playing at a maybe an honorable mention All Big 12 player level, maybe third team All Big 12 player level. That guy's got to get more than one shot in the last 15 minutes of game. So. Those are those would be my mains, and then you know, reflecting you know recency bias from yesterday, get more from your bigs. Um, Gasson and McNair have to be more efficient, take care, better care of the basketball, yeah. and get more shots at the rim. So, those would be my keys that I want to see this week moving forward. Yeah, McNair yesterday he had nine rebounds. I said last night with Drew he probably could add fourteen. He yeah. also had five turnovers. I guess you know maybe. <laughs> They were like, yeah, yeah. those five rebounds, there are the turnovers right there. And he had four block shots, too. Yeah, yeah, and he was three of six, and he did make some buckets late that were, were crucial, but he's got to be better. And uh, David Gasson, like I said it after the West Virginia game, and I think some guys were tongue-in-cheeking it, and they are like, well, yeah, you'll take that. He's shooting this and this. That The point is not what he's shooting in his efficiency. It's that he will have those games where he has 17 against West Virginia, and then he has five against Texas Tech and mm -hmm. was non-existent on offense. And really, like, he didn't do anything defensively for K-State yesterday other than, you know, being in, in the way and being a big body in there. But he didn't grab rebounds for him. Like, David Gasson can be frustrating because this year especially, we have seen him go to a different level, be a better player, be a legitimate guy that you look at and say, I would like to have K-State have David Gasson back on the roster next year and be somebody that can help them. But you would like for him to be able to step up a little bit more consistently, and you know we'll see if that ever actually comes about for him. Uh, last question about K-State for this coming week. You guys have to tell me if they go 0-2, 1-1, or 2-0. So uh, give me your predictions here because I'm on record. I, I do think they go 2-0. and And everybody listening, I know that's uncharacteristic because I'm not a sunshine bumper <laughs> and – I'm I'm so negative, which I appreciated the question earlier in the week on the board when somebody yeah. asked. I've noticed you're more <laughs> negative. Than, that's true. That is very true. Uh, but I do think K State goes two and zero this week. So, uh, Drew, feet to the fire. What are the cats doing this week? I'll be the negative Nancy and say one and one. Okay. Uh, I, I think that Baylor's just due to shoot the lights out in one game. Yeah, I. I'm probably the opposite of you. I think I've been asked on the board if I ever pick us to lose. <laughs> and I and I did pick us to lose against mm -hmm. Texas Tech. But I, I think this is a 2-0 week. If this team is what I think they are, um, I think they respond well to a, a, a tough loss. But at the same time, you know, I'm not trying to sugarcoat it, but almost every team seems to have a loss like that at some point during the season. I hope we got ours out of the way and uh, we can avoid that down the stretch. Um, you know, we, we've we've talked about Tang's record in overtime games. And, and in general, I think if you would just go back and look at games that are within five points at the under four, which is I really – because that, that's really, to me, if you really want to test close games, is those games that were within two possessions at the under four timeout. Because sometimes those t games turn into 12-point losses or 12-point wins. But I think those are really the measure of, of a good team in close games is when you win those games. I think Tang has been pretty good in his career, and I think we'll win two games this week. Good to do. Good to know. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's close it out. Give some due to some people that deserve it. They played a great game yesterday against Texas. The K-State women are yeah. – I don't know if the AP Bowl can deny them this week to be in the top ten, so they're going to be in there. They're now 5-0 and to start Big 12 play. They got a big win yesterday at home over number 10 Texas, which – Look, I, I, anybody that has listened to me for however long knows that I'm really big on backing up wins with another win, and this was a massive week for them. They had all this hype, 
and everybody was putting a lot of emphasis on they were going to play two home games. They took care of Oklahoma, an inferior team, and then a Texas team that I know that they were down, one of their best players. But that's still a team that on paper should have more talent than K-State and has a lot of things going for them. And K-State, even when they got down a couple possessions and you thought, oh, here we go. I, Chris Nelson, I think maybe 10 times thought that it was over for K-State there. Uh, the Cats fought back. They they won the second half and they Nelly won the game. makes you look at like one of the most positive people in the world. <laughs> yeah, he does. He does. Yeah, I, he, it makes me look like, man, this guy, he's really he's really friendly to everybody. Uh, that massive win for them yesterday against Texas. They're now 5-0, and uh, they get ready for two games this week at TCU on Wednesday. And then Saturday – they are at home against KU before the men play Oklahoma State. So the women tip off at 1, and then the men go later in the evening, I think uh, 6 o'clock or Six. so. Uh, that I I have been informed that I will be attending both games <laughs> on Saturday. Uh, yeah, that, that we got a call a couple of weeks ago, and my mother-in-law was like, I bought tickets. Uh, are you guys going? It's like, well, I guess we'll figure out a way to get a five-month-old to go to Manhattan, and she might have to take in two games on Saturday <laughs> too. So we'll see how that ends up playing out. Uh, but I wanted to give a shout out to the K-State women because I think a lot of people have been watching more than a usual amount. Obviously, it helps that they're good, but you know, kind of a pack mentality. Everybody has kind of geared in and locked in a little bit more, and they are genuinely genuinely fun to watch and i say that as somebody that i mean look i i like jeff mitty i think he's a fine guy but i want to smack him in the face sometimes when i see his team shooting 29 percent from three on the season like get you some shooters that's how you win games jeff but they're finding a way to do it because they're awesome defensively and they have one of the best players in the country in aoka lee so uh wanted to give them a shout out and give them their due and and see what thoughts you guys had on the k-state women for uh, their awesome start. I mean, they are officially in the driver's seat to be the Big 12 champs this year. I know there's a lot of games left to get it sorted out, but the fact that they've shown up in massive games this year against Iowa in one on the road, and then Texas comes to town and you beat them, and you've already beat some other ranked teams on your schedule uh, throughout. Like th this is this team is legit right now, and they're going to give K State an opportunity to have something to be really excited about. So. Shout out to the K-State women. Yeah, they, they're legitimate national title contenders, which is, I, I guess, I don't want to say crazy to say at a school like K-State, but, like, it's crazy to think that, like, they are that good. Like, they, if especially if they go 2-0 and this week, they're definitely in the driver's seat to at least win the Big 12. And it, it's they're fun to watch. I mean, I, I've watched probably half of their games. And they, I mean, they, they play very, very good defense that Texas, that Texas team, I think averages like close or above 80 points per game and K-State held them down to 58. So they, they get it done. They're fun because of the whole gap goat thing and holding up the goat <laughs> like that. Everything about them is fun and they just keep winning and they f keep finding ways to win. Yeah. Ayo can lead. The only person at K State that we've seen put up the efficiency numbers is Michael Beasley in, in her realm. I mean, she's 1.37 efficiency, which is just ridiculous. Her per player efficiency rating is 47. Uh, Michael Beasley's was 39.8. Um, and those are pretty comparable given possessions. Those are pretty comparable numbers. Michael, efficient, Michael Beasley's efficiency was 1.20. Eokalese is 1.37. Uh, Eokalese scores 43 points per 100 possessions. Michael Beasley scored 46. So just unreal efficiency numbers for Eokalee. Um, and enough guard play um, around them that they, they can be that Big 12 champion check defender, maybe the Final Four defender. I do think the key for them will be, Mason, you've brought it up multiple times, but the three-point shooting – um, they're, they're going to have to be more like a 33, 34, 35% team, not a 30% team if they want to go uh, to the heights K-State women basketball has never seen, which is getting to an Elite Eight, Final Four type situation. We've won some big 12s with the ladies, which is which is something this team can, I think, match if they play to their potential. Uh, right now, K-State 
is shooting over 31% from three. Um, I'm going back to compile this to make sure that I have the uh, right numbers. That would be the best three point shooting season for the K state women since 2017, when they shot 33%, they have in three of the last four, four of the last five, they've been under 30% for the season. So they, they do not shoot it well, typically. Uh, and so it's, that is going to be a, a question. You think about yesterday's game, like some of the keys for them is you give credit to, I mean, Zayana Walker hit a big three at the end of the third quarter that gave them the lead in the middle of a big run. So like getting that was huge. Glenn hit some big threes for them that, well, she hit two of them, <laughs> but they were both, they both felt big. I think anytime I see the K-State women make a three, I go, that's big because they normally don't get those. Like they they made the shots they needed and then they let their defense. I mean, Texas has been like an all world offense this year in terms of the rest of the country. And I think they were averaging over 80 points. K State held them to 58 points yesterday. They shot 20, they missed 40 shots yesterday. They were 22 of 62. They only made two threes. Like they were really, really good where they needed to be yesterday. And uh now, I mean, 17 and one and five and oh, especially when you think of the fact that in their non conference, the K-State women played three ranked teams, and two of them were Iowa, both <laughs> times a top five team. Uh, and, and you go two and one against those top 20 opponents you faced, and then they've killed basically everybody else. And what did we just talk about with the K-State men against Oklahoma State versus Baylor? It's the K-State women, not only are they just beating the bad teams on their schedule, they are they are beating them down every single night. You're not playing with fire i mean that their closest game that they've played recently was 16 and 17 points and wins against ucf and oklahoma and it's like those are what close games have been for them until they faced a good team like texas so they are the real deal right now they're a lot of fun and uh, i i am looking forward to going and seeing them against ku this weekend which like i'm not too shy to admit like that will be the first KU women's K State women's basketball game that I've intentionally intended attended since my freshman year of college. When K State, uh, I guess I went to a K State Iowa State game my sophomore year on my own volition, but I went to the K State UConn game my freshman year, and that was that was an awesome experience. And they played well. I think they only got beat by like twenty five. Which <laughs> that that version of UConn that was like winning the game. You go, yeah. man, you you played a tight one with these guys. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to it because they they are fun right now. And uh, like I said, they are doing it despite the fact that I'm going to throw up every time I see them shoot a three. But everything else is going to look really, really good out there. Yeah. All right. Well, probably a good spot to end it. Uh, we talked about K-State and uh, how everything's going basketball-wise, both sides trending in the right direction. I mean, the women have been trending in the right direction all season long. The men are, are finally starting to catch up. Should be a good week for K-State in a lot of regards, so we'll keep tabs on that. And we'll have full coverage throughout the week, every game that goes on for the Wildcats, also everything in the in-between. D.Y. and I, I imagine, will be back tomorrow. If not, we'll be back Tuesday morning getting ready for K-State and Baylor because it's a huge one for the Cats in terms of looking for that first quad one win and uh, everything else that goes with it and just really grabbing momentum, which is such a significant thing for this team, more than other teams in the past that we've seen. So that will do it for us for Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan. I am Mason Voth. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online and uh, make sure you head over to kstateonline.com over at On3 to check out all the coverage of the Cats and also you can make your voice heard. You can ask why I'm so negative. We can argue about high school <laughs> shot clocks. Whatever comes to mind, you can do it over on the foundation or premium message board and uh, also get really good insight from fan Drew and DY and I'm I'm just kind of lurking there to to get people riled up or you know give them stuff that reinforces their beliefs. So we are out of here. Thanks for watching K State online.